great pleasure to introduce our, our two speakers today. Um, they come from the Nature Conservancy in uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. And uh, we, we have uh, Kristen Blahn, who's a freshwater ecologist at Nature Conservancy. Uh, she's also the science strategy lead for the, um, the Peatland Climate Mitigation and Restoration um, Program. We're going to hear more about the, the playbook uh, today. And then also Chris Leonard, uh, sorry if I mis mispronounced that. Uh, he's a restoration ecologist at the Nature Conservancy and also a professor of a research professor of, of uh, bioproducts and bioengineering at the University of Minnesota. Um, thanks very much for, for being with us here today. All right, thank you all for inviting us um, to present. We are uh, really working to uh, build our network and, and meet folks like yourselves to uh, bring additional expertise to the um, to the playbook project, and um, you know, I come I come to this project uh, as a sort of freshwater ecologist, conservation planner, eco hydrologist with a long term interest in drainage. But um, certainly, I'm not I I am on a big learning curve about peatland. So I recognize that um, there's probably folks on this call that know more about peatlands than I do, and we really want to get your feedback and input on our strategy. And anyone in the audience um, today who wants to, you know, continue to engage with us, we welcome we welcome your input. I'm just going to give kind of a big picture overview about natural climate solutions of the Nature Conservancy, um, and why why we're looking at peatlands in that context, why peatlands are so important, and kind of a big picture overview of our strategy and the mapping that we've done so far, and and the feasibility both on the biophysical side and the social economic feasibility assessment we've been working on. And then Chris is gonna go into more detail in kind of our, our restoration effect, effectiveness studies that we are getting into to try to um, both understand what's going on in Minnesota as well as um, uh, To understand what's going on in Minnesota, as well as kind of uh, get data on the effectiveness and the climate benefits of, of peatland restoration. So, hopefully, you're familiar with the concept of natural climate solutions. I think Minnesota's calling them like working lands and land management in the, in the state climate action plan. It's basically helping to um, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions by improving management or restoring um, forests, grasslands, and wetlands, as well as. As, as better management on working lands like forest grasslands and wetlands, I mean on farms and ranch lands. So we have lots of analyses now showing that you know the land-based emissions are a big part of the, the overall climate budget. And these pathways, if we if we do the right things, the estimate from Griscom in 2017 and a whole lot of other uh, authors, lots of conservancy and other scientists um, estimated that uh, these land and water-based pathways could provide up to a third or more of the mitigation needed to limit warming to one and a half to two degrees Celsius, which I know is um, being debated as <laughs> how close we are to uh, passing that threshold. But anyway, it's critical, obviously, to protect these carbon stores and to restore the ones um, as sinks or um, make them as much of sinks and less of sources because of the amount of carbon that is in already being stored in soil and biomass. And we know that wetlands have, you know, the huge, huge um, amount of stored carbon in, in soil and underground biomass. Globally, wetlands and peatlands are a big part of that, have uh, even larger carbon stocks than forests because of the carbon stored in the in the in the depths of the peat soils. So you probably heard the 3% of the Earth's land service, but almost or more than a third of stored terrestrial carbon. And North American peatlands are about 32% of that. Most of that's in Canada, but um, it, that peatland, North Temperate peatland band extends into Minnesota. And it's often called irrecoverable carbon because once it's lost to the atmosphere, it's very difficult to get it back on a time frame meaningful for restoring peatlands. So, in the 
2017 uh, paper that came out, they, they listed um, different critical natural climate solution pathways along with sort of uncertainty bars. Peat restoration and avoided peat impacts to peatlands were both very important, but they also had these big uncertainty bars in terms of uh, net greenhouse gas effects. And part of that is the methane question, which um, Chris is also going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, this is a map from DNR of Minnesota peatlands and another version of that map in a, uh, of, of histosols from Sergo. Uh, I said it's irrecoverable carbon, and in fact, in Minnesota, we have we've been working um, and advised by some of the scientists who are up at the Grand Rapids U.S. Forest Service Station. And the Marcel Experimental Forest has the big spruce study, um, spruce and peatland responses under changing environment, where they've got these chambers um, where they're varying amount of warming and moisture in order to simulate the effects of different climate scenarios on peatlands that are, are not drained at all, that they're intact. And they're finding that pretty much all of the warming scenarios are, are causing um, the peat to become a source instead of serving as a sink. And um, Chris is also going to talk in more detail about this, but we know that when you drain peatlands and you pull the water table down, um, it causes both a release of carbon dioxide as as those exposed soil layers and exposed car, um, organic matter starts to oxidize and decompose from microbial activity. And then the open water in the ditches is also a source of methane. Uh, but I also want to start by acknowledging that there's a lot of definitions of, of out there for what peatlands are and peat soils, and it's tough. It can be tough to be sure what we're talking about. So, in general, you know, in the most general sense, it's obviously a wetland characterized by long-term accumulation of organic matter from decaying plant materials under waterlogged or saturated conditions, uh, because those saturated conditions are are anoxic. Um, that organic material is accumulating over hundreds of thousands of years, uh, 30 feet or more, like the, the peat at Marcel, for instance, is, is up to 10 feet deep and estimated to be 11,000 years old, so um, accumulating since the last, last ice age. Um, and this happens at very slow rates, but it it accumulates over time. This, this graphic is from a, a Pew Trust website on that they just put together. And in Minnesota, if we, but if we look at it according to the native plant community classification, um, the peatland plant community types are the acid peatland, which is the lowest pH. It's kind of a binomial distribution um, uh, where there's also forested peatlands and open rich peatland systems. Um, and extensive peatlands have formed in Minnesota in those Glacial remnants of the glacial lake basins, the glacial lake Agassiz, Agassiz um, north of the Red Lakes, and then in various glacial basins west of north and west of Duluth in the uh, Aitken and St. Louis counties. Um, but peat soils, um, and because of the saturated poor conditions, they often have very unique plant communities, several species of carnivorous plants like the pitcher plant and the sundew. And sphagnum moss is, is the ecosystem engineer of these peat communities. It creates, and there's a, a whole lot of different species that can, can create, help create the acid conditions and the microtopography that, that can support those um, characteristic plants and the aeration shrubs, such as cranberry, bog rosemary, and leatherleaf, as well as trees such as tamarack and spruce that maybe don't like to be as wet, but can get up on those sphagnum hummocks. But we, but we also talk about peat in wetlands, smaller um, peat wetland soils, peat soils. So if you're familiar with how the soils are classified, they're, they're often mapped as histosols and defined by NRCS as soils that are dominantly organic, uh, more than 20 or 30% organic matter, you know, anywhere from over 30 centimeters to 40 centimeters or more in depth and formed due to these saturated wetland conditions. And using that definition, the histosols um, 
in fact, the plant community map only covers the two northeastern ecoregions, and we we see histocells that um, were mapped all the way through the southern and western part of the state in smaller wetland uh, basins that qualify for that definition. And but a lot of these wells have been drained and converted to agriculture, so we don't even know some of them may never have even been mapped as peat soils. We know that many of Minnesota's peatlands and peat soils were uh, extensively impacted by extensive drainage efforts, primarily in the early 1900s on, massive attempts to drain both wetlands and Minnesota's um, peatlands. And we know, you know, it's estimated about 21,000 miles of drainage ditches across Minnesota, of which, you know, 15, 20% or 4,000 miles are intersecting with our state peatlands. And uh, in central and southern Minnesota, that drain, those drainage efforts were successful in terms of draining the soils and making them usable for agriculture and converting them. But in these more extensive peatland basins in northern Minnesota, often they, they failed economically. And millions of acres ultimately reverted to state or county administration through tax forfeit and left the counties and drainage authorities with a heavy tax burden. So it became a, a kind of administered by the state to reduce the tax burden. And the social history of drainage is such a fascinating topic to me. If there's any audience I've ever spoken to that might be interested in, you guys are it. So I just was gonna do this little aside on interesting additional reading on that, the, the chapters in Pattern Peatlands on the ditching of Red Lake during the Homestead era and on the opposition to drainage, particularly from the, the tribes in the Red Lake Ojibwe. And more recent book that is is pretty fun, uh, Swamplands. And the, this is, I don't know, 15, 20 years old. This one covers kind of the drainage era and the opposite wetlands of the American Midwest. It's pretty interesting historical geography of changing attitudes. Anyway, uh, back to the topic at hand. Uh, we know that when native perennial grasslands and forests are drained and converted to croplands, they, they lose often within the first five years up to 50% of the carbon and organic matter that's stored in that top layer. And for peat soil, that's especially significant because there's so much of that to begin with. And the MPCA actually um, included cultivated histosols as, as one of the state's major sources of emissions, fourth largest after, after um, gas, coal, and light duty trucks. And this is from a Star Tribune article that was published in February of this year um, using some of our, our data and showing kind of that where those completely drained histosols is, is mostly across the southern part of the state and western, northwestern. Um, so, and, and this legacy is still with us because a lot of the ditches are often still there. They, they are sometimes maintained and sometimes abandoned, but they haven't completely recovered. And they um, are, while we were working on our strategy, Liam Prouse was with Michigan Tech, was working with some Forest Service partners to estimate kind of what the total volume loss had been from those ditches since the beginning of the drainage era. And he, did some work. Um, they the, they did some work mapping this, and then developed a, like a regression model to look at at how much carbon had been lost and what the ongoing loss of carbon was from subsidence and 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 uh, exposure to oxygenated environments from bringing that drainage down. And it it is um, and in addition to kind of the uh, so this is an ongoing carbon stock loss. So it suggests that you know if we were to restore these peatlands, we're not just starting over to sequester the carbon, but we would be stopping that ongoing carbon loss. And that is often not I don't included in a lot of the kind of scaled up estimates. Uh, I think Chris is going to talk a little more about uh, that. But overall, sort of. So we framed our big picture strategy in terms of maintaining or expanding protections for intact peatlands because they're so important and it's always, you know, uh, more cost effective from a climate standpoint to, to avoid carbon stock losses. 
but we looked at these partially drained um, legacy peatlands that are still losing carbon as a potential kind of cost-effective way. Of, and we wanted to uh, assess the feasibility of this, both biophysically, social, and socially and economically, and kind of look at financing for, as well as feasibility for restoration of those partially drained ditches. And then we also have been, as part of our overall freshwater strategy, which is focused on uh, a big a goal of restoring wetlands for water storage and water quality, but also potentially um, carbon benefits in the, in the agricultural part of the state. So um, we just want to kind of do a first step high level assessment and estimate the costs and the opportunities in each of those areas. So we started off by trying to map <laughs> these different the peatlands according to these different categories, as well as understand from literature review and expert partners and advisory groups kind of what are the important things to be mapping and paying attention to and thinking about in terms of the feasibility of restoration um, and come up with some initial estimates. So um, just to get a little bit more into what counted in our mapping of PEEP and what our data sources look like, we, we uh, had our spatial uh, scientists put together statewide maps of different surgo variables and particularly the histocell taxonomy, but also some of the other variables, statewide maps of variables like the soil organic content in the top layers of soil. Um, and then we're looking at that crosswalking that against, trying to crosswalk that against the, the native potential plant community potential. This is actually a model from NRI developed and it, it does not extend past the um, the prairie port or the eastern broadleaf forest ecological province, so it doesn't go into the prairies. But uh, and then there's been a recent update to the National Wetland Inventory that identify landforms and peat types. There's also a peat inventory, a point data set with uh, thousands of of records from the 70s and 80s peat inventory and. I mentioned some of the other Sergo variables, MINDOT as a historic vegetation potential model. And then we're kind of looking at other things like forest composition models um, that, that estimate biomass of spruce or tamarack, um, forgetting it that above ground biomass. So uh, this is just kind of a hot off the presses crosswalk, but just to see how those uh, peat vegetation and peat definitions can vary. I don't know how well this tried to match the color scheme to the analysis, but the this kind of olive color is where there's overlap between the native plant community classification and the national wetland inventory and the histosol soils. Um, and then there's somewhere it's only mapped as native plant community, uh, a, a peatland uh, plant community type, but not histosols or wetlands. NWI and histosol overlap is is this sort of um, western and central bands across the state. And then histosols only in the southern part of the state, mainly because those other layers didn't really extend that far. Um, so kind of weight of evidence for what should what is peatland. <laughs> um, and then we looked at that in relation to land cover uh, from the National Land Cover Database and the NAS cropland data layer for, for land classified as hay, pasture, or cropland, uh, and get somewhere between 330 to 400,000 acres of total of cultivated histosols. And I'm sorry, the colors are not, I don't have time to make this map easier to read, but the yellows you're going to see, obviously, across the northwest and central and southern part of the state. And then there's some peat soils mapped as in, in developed class categories as well. Um, and Bowser is actually working with us to maybe develop a tool for initial, you know, as a first pass that looking at where there might be um, where wetland restoration for carbon mitigation might be uh, an important uh, benefit or criteria for, for wetland restoration. Uh, in terms of mapping drainage, the NRI has also produced kind of a very fine scale restorable wetland index more recently. That's 
it's um, it's kind of a problem with their data server, but it's more finer scale than the 30 meter resolution one that they did in 2014. And it kind of ranks the probability that a wetland is there, that this is a wet area and that in, um, it, it doesn't, it's not sorted by land cover. So not everything that shows up, some, a lot of what shows up on the restorable wetland index already is a wetland, but it, it's also identifying kind of feature to the landscape that we've that have been affected by drainage. So we looked also at altered water courses, the altered water course map that DNR has produced, um, which kind of categorizes whether um, channels have been analyzed or altered in some way. And you just see from the graph paper that uh, there's a lot of that. <laughs> it sort of blew my mind the first time I saw this map when I came to grad school from the in Minnesota. Uh, and also you'll notice there's a big hole in that in the that is the Red Lake reservation. They definitely were opposed to uh, to that kind of drainage. And there were others who um, didn't think it was a good idea, but they did not prevail. So uh, what we did there more recently the DNR buffer map has kind of clarified the public versus private ditches here. And that accounts for some of the differences between my analysis and that the one that Liam Krauss did, because uh, they were more focused on the public ditches. And I'm going to skip this one because I already talked a little bit about what happens. But basically, the Bowser estimates that the lateral effect of these drainages is somewhere between 50 and 200 meters. We um, so. I buffered the altered water courses by 150 meters to get some initial estimates of total area. And I'm sorry, now this table is in hectares because originally I was trying to be a good scientist and use <laughs> metric. Um, but this is basically like 476,000 acres of uh, total ditch impacted peat out of roughly 6 million, depending on which data layer you use look at this is not the complete crosswalk um more than half of it of that drain more than half of that peat is on is publicly administered land a lot of it is state most of it's state forest land a lot of state wma land and a lot of school trust land but more of the forest land and wma land is impacted uh, as a percentage um by by if you look at just the area of intersection of the 100 feet 50 meter buffer with with that um, peat map. And then we just took some numbers from the literature uh, ranges to estimate what the the climate mitigation potential of restoring those by adding together sort of the stop loss or the avoided stock loss plus the potential at sequestration rate on top of that um, to get some initial estimates for those partially drained ditches. And it's, it's you know, it's still pretty small compared to some of our other, I think, very optimistic and ambitious estimates of what can be done on ag and forest lands. Um, and then there's still a lot of uncertainty on the avoided peatland conversion as well, just because we don't know how much of this to estimate is at risk for one reason or another. Uh, so where are we headed with this? Um, our playbook, we're trying to refine our map and greenhouse gas estimates, work through um, the biophysical and social feasibility and some of the issues around financing to bring it to scale, working with uh, trying to build a, a network with partners to um, develop a statewide strategy and then get into the science. I'm going to hurry up here because oh, I've got some better slides on this. Um, and Chris is going to talk more about this too, but, you know, what we've learned so far from the lit review is that in general, the, the effect of peatland restoration compared to the no action is, you know, initially, uh, if we didn't do anything, oh, this isn't the right, huh. um, and if we don't do anything, they are, are going to continue to to be more sources of carbon and methane to the atmosphere we can restore by 
um, plugging the ditches, you can restore the sink over time. But the, there's a lot of uncertainty about the methane dynamics, and I'm not going to let Chris talk more about that. Um, but also, sort of which of these drain peatland types and peat soils should we be prioritizing for restoration, and where are the best opportunities? Uh, we're making some progress on that. Um, in terms of, you know, what's the context for doing this at scale in Minnesota, you know, we, we have the SNA protections, the Wetland Conservation Act, which is um, theoretically protects all wetlands and requires mitigation, but we know there are these exceptions and it's, it's not going to drive uh, peat restoration as climate mitigation, but it's, it provides us a bunch of mitigation bank and restored sites that are uh, opportunities to look at um, and learn from. And then right now, peatlands are named in the climate, Minnesota Climate Action Plan that just came out, but doesn't go into much detail about <laughs> what's uh, involved. Uh, and then lots of folks are looking at carbon finance, and there is a VERA standard for northern temperate peatland rewetting projects, but there apparently are, uh, and it has kind of a robust verification standard, but there are apparently no examples on the books of of people who have done that to account for carbon finance. So we're just looking at different policy mechanisms to allow payment for ecosystem services on private or even public land which requires maybe making some changes to state law. Um, and then uh, there's an overlap with obviously with uh, forest carbon in, in the lowland conifers forest types. So uh, there are some uh, standards for family forest carbon working. So we're, we're working to, I said, uh, uh, identify sort of low hanging Route for opportunities for restoration and monitoring, learning from what others are doing, uh, using numbers and models from the spruce and Marcel experimental forest, as well as uh, wetland mitigation beds that are being restored at SAC Zim. Um, and then in Red Lake WMA, there have been some restorations done for other reasons. And we're also uh, building out kind of a, a peat restoration network, building on in particular off Canadian experience and then PNC's um, Global Natural Climate Solutions Peat Network. I'm going to, I want to give Chris plenty of time, so I'm just going to, Browns Lake, Peatland, a um, couple of these, Browns Lake and Winter Road are up here and have uh, had some ditch plugging work done at different times that are potential sites to look at. This is the peat inventory sites. And then there are some proposed um, restoration sites also in Winter Road and Wawina that um, we'd love to work with others to kind of figure out how to expedite uh, restoration. The Saxon bog I referred to that Chris, where we're gonna be working um, is probably the largest. It covers almost the whole Huck 12 watershed, 23,000 acres. So there's an opportunity to even look at hydrologic benefits. Um, so it has, it has, um, and it has also kind of become internationally renowned as a as a destination for bird watching, and that has generated some some economic benefit to the area. That is is another kind of plus on the restoration side. And we're had a couple articles written about where that's going recently, um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris and. I know I went through that quickly, so they're welcome to follow up with me afterwards if you have. I, we wanted to leave plenty of time for a Q&A, too. So, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Kristen. All right. So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, kind of preliminary research and uh, some future work. And, yeah, thanks. So, this is a little overview of some of the past studies and uh, future work here. Like Kristen mentioned, uh, Liam Krauss, a Michigan Tech grad student working with uh, some of the forestry service researchers, Eric Vilskov and Randy Kalka. He did this uh, research on the ongoing effects of the drainage ditches on carbon loss in the Minnesota peatlands. Uh, and we picked up on that, uh, did some of our own GIS mapping, Kristen and Dale, some of the maps she was showing. I'll show another one that uh, 
master's student that was working with me, Cole Regan, made. And then go into a little bit more on the on the gas monitoring. So the first part was this kind of mapping, seeing where the peatlands are, um, drainage impacts, and then going into, you know, how does that affect the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, carbon dioxide, and methane. And a couple studies here, one with Annie Willie, master student uh, working with me at the University of Minnesota, and then the U.S. Forest Service group that was collecting the end of this year. And then our future work with this LCCMR grant that was recommended for funding. We don't actually have it yet, so I just want to say that. <clears throat> oh yeah, you can go next slide, please. All right, so and um, as we've referred to, you know, the the ditches impact um, the peat and it create kind of a zone of um, subsidence or kind of compaction of this of the soil when you draw it down and it, this lower right figure here this was from a lidar Cole was actually going um, going around looking at lidar trying to see how much um, peat had been lost in that in the drainage impact zone um, so on that lower graph it shows the uh, the lower line the blue line is um, the water table after drainage and then the kind of yellowish green line is um, the, the peat service um, after drainage and then the purple one was kind of the original water table estimated you know before drainage so you can see how it kind of creates this uh wedge or like almost triangle like shape area of carbon loss and then you know when that's rewetted then you have an area that's often more open water i mean they'll be blocked up with logs and things to dam it up but there's often a pretty big area of open water along where the ditch itself used to be and that has some consequences for the gas exchange we'll talk about a little bit here um yeah and the map the map on the previous one sorry they just showed where the concentrations of the drainage impacted peatlands were we have all these different maps but they're yeah a couple of really concentrated areas of drainage and one of those um yeah is in that area between Duluth and Grand Rapids that's where the Saxon bog is and yeah you can go back to the next slide uh, thanks yeah and so there's been a lot of work done there so there's this mitigation bank um SEH and Derek Daschle were monitoring that for the was the ecosystem investment partners and they're reporting to Bowser to make sure they were you know restoring the wetlands adequately in terms of the hydrology and the vegetation and yeah you can there's a fly-in graph yeah so they so Derek's been really helpful to us in um sharing the reports and things that they have they've been monitoring it for a long time I mean, going back to 2013 so you can see this you know as a water table graph one of the wells in the restored area uh, water table kind of fluctuates between slightly ponded those are kind of inches on the on the left and then these are each individual year so it you know starts out high slightly ponded maybe a few inches and then it'll drop through the summer you know down to five ten inches below the ground but it's almost always saturated near the surface and you know that's what you need to get um, maintain this sphagnum like moss growing and trying to get it to spread back over some of those open water areas. Last year was a real drought. It was one of the driest years I think ever recorded in, in that region of Minnesota. It was extremely dry. And so it, water tables dropped way down, you know, you know, minus what, 30 inches. So nearly three feet at that one and more than that in others. And so, you know, in those conditions, you do get a lot more um, carbon dioxide release from the, from the bogs. Yeah, you can go to the next one. All right, yeah, and then um, just moving into some of the University of Minnesota research. This was a uh, master's project. Anna Willey uh, worked on with me. She's a uh, grad student in the NRSM program, and she was looking at uh, carbon dioxide emissions from a fen in a bog, one in central Minnesota, which was a fen, uh, which we've been working on with TNC and the U for a number of years, and then sex in bog. She also looked at phosphorus dynamics, but we'll talk about that here. You can go to the next slide. Just a little background on that um, before I show the results. Um, and so, you know, the, the bogs can be, they're both, a, you know, a source and a sink for CO2. As Kristen mentioned, historically, they've been big sinks for carbons, you know, over about the last thousands of years. Uh, more recently, you know, with warming, um, drainage and they become sometimes a more of a source of co2 emissions 
or at least less of a sink in some cases. Um, and, you know, as you draw the water table down, it warms up, increases the microbial breakdown of the organic matter, and that's what releases the CO2. Um, on a natural wetland, that's balanced out by the uptake of CO2 by plants. At the same time, you are uh, kind of countering the, the benefit of the CO2 sequestration by the plants is the release of methane. Well, methane is a strong greenhouse gas. Um, and so when you wet it, it um, tends to release more methane when you get anaerobic, you know, and uh, higher water tables. Um, when it's drained, they tend to reduce um, the methane release, although it can shift more toward the ditches where you have open water, you tend to get more methane release off of open water than an area covered by moss. All right, I can go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and this is, I know this is gonna be hard to really see, this is kind of small, but this is just showing some of the research on this is pretty pretty well documented. Uh, if you, um, you know, re-wet these areas, the, raise the water table, you'll get more methane release, um, but you'll decrease the CO2. You can great, you know, you can almost shut off or greatly reduce the CO2 emissions when you rewet these peatlands, but then you have this countering problem of methane release. And that's what we're gonna be looking at more with the LCCMR grant. Um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, and they're just showing some of um some of Annie Willie's data from the fan in the bog. What it showed was uh there was actually a lot more CO2 emissions coming off of the fen and the bog. Um, fen was probably more altered environment, um, lower water table, even after being restored. Um, probably also warmer because of the groundwater, a longer sort of growing season, warm period, and then sac sim, whereas, you know, cold and inactive for much of the year. Uh, <clears throat> and it's also strongly related to the, yeah, the water table, the CO2 release. You can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and so we, we were monitoring the water tables at this um, both sites, but um, for longer at this fen in, uh, in Cold Spring, which is in the center of the state near St. Cloud. All right, you can go to the, the next slide. This is some of the results from that uh, study. <laughs> but what are, what any study was showing was that uh, there's a there's a really strong relationship between the water tables and the CO2 release, and so you can manage that somewhat in these restored wetlands if you can. Uh, you know, saturate it at the top. And uh, there's trade-offs between getting it too wet and the methane release and the plant establishment, which we'll talk about in some of these slides. Um, just say that, so there's, um, yeah, the strong relationship, but it, there's other variables. Um, you know, it's a microbial process, the breakdown of organic matter. So there's some factors that are a little less predictable. And when we were doing these gas emissions measurements, um, as well as what the, the Forest Service people doing them up in Saxon Bog, well, the, both the CO2 and the methane um, numbers were kind of unpredictable in ways that we, well, I couldn't really understand exactly because it was unpredictable. <laughs> okay, I yeah, can move to the next one, please. Um, yeah, and so just one of some of the lessons learned, and, you know, is, from that is that the hydrologic goals for Wetland Mitigation Bank. Uh, like the Saxon bog, might be slightly different than if you were restoring them, um, you know, solely for climate change mitigation. So if you're, you know, just trying to get the credits for wetland mitigation, you only need it to be you know, wet in the top foot for long enough to have, you know, the wetland hydrology legally, and then, you know, get the reestablishment of the vegetation. They did have additional vegetation requirements in Saxon bog for that project to have a certain quality or FQA scores that SEH was monitoring that as well, but, but the point is here, so you, you'd want it to be um, saturated um, near the surface to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions, um, but you'd, you'd want to uh, also get the sphagnum to moss growth, um, but you'd want to minimize the methane emissions, and that might be accomplished uh, by not having ponded water. So, you know, perhaps in a more typical mitigation bank, you just get it as flooded as you could, as wet as you can, but with control methane, you want to have the layer of moss over the top and not have it be, say, like two feet deep of water. So it would kill the moss. And you also get more methane coming off, off of open water because there's nothing to sort of filter it or slow the release of it, you know, from the, the bed to set it become the bottom. All right, yeah, you can go ahead. 
Yeah, all right. So, and then, yeah, so we just um, been working on, on that stuff for um, well, the last two years. And then we applied for this LCCMAR grant uh, led by University of Minnesota with Forest Service and TNC. We have various components that we're planning to do. Uh, we're gonna, so we're gonna monitor the greenhouse gas emissions in a lot more depth. So those readings we were showing uh, were based on chambers. So we put this um, gas monitoring device called the LICOR on the base of the peat over a collar and you measure, you know, measure the gas coming off just for a few minutes at a bunch of different spots. But in order to get a more continuous um, measurement of the gas that's coming off, you need these um, towers, which show here on the right with Tim Griffiths. He's a professor at the university that does uh, micrometeorology. Um, so he's used these towers a lot in past studies. And so we, the grant would go to paying for several of these towers. We'd put the towers on restored areas, ditched areas, natural areas, and compare the methane and CO2 coming off those areas up around the Saxon bog. All the other two parts of it are, we're also gonna be met looking at the mercury issue, which we haven't really talked about yet, but I you know a lot, various studies have found um, restoring wetlands can sometimes increase concentrations of methyl mercury, not always, but under certain conditions. So the question is, is that flowing downstream? Um, you know, the, the countering effect is that when you restore peatland, you're damming up the water levels. You're generally reducing the amount of water that's flowing out of them. So you're maybe reducing the total flow out, but there might be um, greater concentrations of methylmercury. So we're going to look at uh, these, these things in several ditches up in that area. Again, sort of restored, ditched, natural. Uh, I'll also be doing some modeling efforts, uh, John Niebuhr, myself, and I have a postdoc and a grad student using this uh, COOP model. I'll be collecting data to fill in the parameters that you need to run that model. So I'll have field data, you know, modeling data to go on for a few few years, or, or said modeling results, I guess you say. Uh, you can advance the next one, please. All right, yeah, and then really that's uh, kind of just wrapping this up. Um, end goal of all this uh, science is to inform the policies, and uh, basically we know we kind of want to protect existing peatlands, uh, especially ones that have really deep fibric peat and, you know, tie that peat up so it isn't breaking down or releasing CO2. But beyond that, you know, where are the most beneficial ones? I mean, we know, on, yeah, you know, the kind of extensive ones in the north, where there's cheap land, you can easily block up ditches without peating roads and, you know, uh, on public land often where it's um, cheaper and you can work with partners. But, you know, there's also looking at the types of peat, um, the ideal water levels for kind of balancing this trade-off between CO2 and methane. Um, and then a lot of the revegetation questions are, are haven't been, I don't know, uh, looked at maybe as much. Um, mostly it's been hydrologic restoration and just, um, you know, allowing it to revegetate as it will. And that's maybe all you do, but in some cases you might try to do some things to re accelerate the spike to moss recovery, and uh, especially over the open water areas. All right, I think that's all. It's, you can go to the next slide. I think that's it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we can have time for questions discussion. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Feel free to post those questions in chat. Um, I don't see anyone right there currently? Probably because you all did such a good job covering everything. Um, so what? Okay. To kind of give a little bit of a starter, and what what part of this? ongoing work of restoration and research do you find most interesting or exciting is that which one is that for is that for Kristen? both of you yeah both yeah want to go first Kristen? think about it <laughs> i find um well the uh, the you know the sex them is the great uh, little case study of 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 a changing you know, kind of attitudes about the environment and, and the recognition of the the value of the native system. And, and they've built such a community of people who are so excited about the biodiversity there in a way that I find really inspiring. <laughs> if you haven't been up there, Friends of Saxonbach has a lot of folks that'll give birding tours or, or veg tours, and they're doing a lot of inventory of other uh, taxa as well. So that that's one answer. <laughs> um, I also personally, I'm I'm 
I'm still looking for people to to or a way to get um, start documenting kind of hydrologic storage and 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 downstream kind of climate flood mitigation benefits maybe from from the high the restoring the hydrology is just I like to geek out on on what it's doing. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> That's probably not. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Oh yeah. Yeah, and for me, you know, I think, I mean, it's a couple of things, I guess on a more personal level, it's kind of fun just to work up in Northern Minnesota in these bogs. I spent so much time working out in Southern Minnesota in the farmland and, and all that, that it's kind of nice to be up there. Um, it's kind of a selfish standpoint, but I guess from a more, you know, policy standpoint, it's just, it's cool seeing these really large areas of restoration. I mean, the Saxon bog is one of the biggest wet, wet, wetlands ever restored in upper Midwest, really, I think. And so it's cool to see that, that, um, yeah, and there's just and there's a lot of interesting science questions. There's a lot of unknowns really with these things. Um, it's been done in a lot of other parts of the world, but not in the restored bogs so much here, right here. That they've done a lot with Mar at Marcel and at those um, exist existing bogs. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Yeah, we uh, last two years we've well last year was ended up getting canceled, but we've done a field trip to Zaxxon Bog and. Had a tour with the friends of the Zaxxon Bog up there. It was it was quite neat. So hopefully we'll go back next year. So WPA folks, go to that field trip. Now you know it's going to be awesome. Um, okay, what state or federal agencies do you have to consult or work with to carry out a restoration in Minnesota? Uh, well, Bowser is kind of the one that coordinates a lot of it, and there are a lot of agencies involved. Um, Primarily DNR. I, I don't know personally. I'm not an expert on kind of when the cores and get would need to be involved in, in these projects. Do you know, Chris? Oh, I mean, I think maybe you know. I mean, in the the tap, I suppose when they're reviewing the plans, actual for the restoration, they could. I mean, they do have the what right to be involved, or they you know a member of the tap. But uh, I don't know that they. I thought on the sex and bog, they mostly passed it on to the local and state people, I thought. Um, and that, I mean, there's the Forest Service too, because a lot of the land is theirs. Um, and there's a lot of state um, DNR forest land too, that's bog. Um, but yeah, in terms of the regulation, I, I guess, I mean, the banks are Bowser and what, I don't know, um, the DNR is public waters um, and, and, and a lot of the land's theirs. And then there's the local governments too. They played a big role, I mean, in this sex in, are typically the county drainage authorities are are very much important to have <laughs> at the table from the very beginning. Yeah. The yeah, I don't know. They had some. I mean, uh, Derek uh, Dashel from SEH is talking about how, yeah, it was kind of a learning experience to promote this kind of restoration because most of it was wetland already, and so they're talking about making it wetter, basically a wetter wetland. Um, and that was a little bit of a change in mindset or, or just what they've been doing, I guess, in that area. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of an interesting take on it. Um, okay, we have a two part question here. I'll read the whole thing and then we'll see if we can, I can read the second part again too, if we need to come back to it. All right, uh, they're curious if the minimization of uh, what is that methane CH4 emissions from open water areas by sphagnum is due to insulating characteristics or is it known why sphagnum minimizes CH4 release? Uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, I can take that one if you want, Chris and our both take a crack at it, but it's, um, so, you know, so the methane is uh, bubbling up kind of from the bottom. And if you have, if you have a, uh, intact moss layer it kind of acts like a sort of like a huge i don't know sort of bio filter in a way it if you if you just go from the surface to open water it, it um you know releases to the air more easily um and it's the same different types of plant cover so we have plants with kind of big you know air spaces in the stems like a bulrush or something that can also make the gas more easy more easily released into the air um yeah so. sedges and cattails um have been found to actually help um, or can channel methane. And I just heard this like yesterday, NPR did a story on Jim Cotner's work um, that urban ponds covered in duckweed. <laughs> duckweed apparently is not helping with the methane, if anything. And I was curious about the mechanism for that too. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think people are still learning a lot. There's been a lot of research on this in other parts of the world. Um, yeah, so I think we still have some things to learn about how it's working up, yeah. up we've there. We've collected but... a lot of papers, but I haven't, we can't say that we've completely synthesized them. And that's why this last bullet point here on the slide is um, we are thinking about trying to convene uh, like a peatland restoration science <laughs> workshop to a couple day workshop and we'll try to bring, you know, a lot of experts together and try to kind of figure out what it, what do we know and where's the edge, where are the key uncertainties and synthesize um, kind of, because a lot of this stuff is coming out. Uh, in fact, just every time I go to do a lit search, there's new papers, so. Uh. Right. Yeah, so, and so on that, I have a second, I forgot to read the second part to that question is, um, for the sphagnum moss, um, how fast can it regenerate? Can it be restored? In, time scale of years it seems like um well chris can talk more about this lynn rochefort there was a, a peat restoration workshop he went to in canada uh, but it does look like certainly some species of sphagnum do recolonize very quickly and and if you have the local seed in fact like at sac zim they used local tamarack and spruce trees that had sphagnum on the roots to, to block the ditches and that served as kind of a, a seed sort or you know a, a colonization substrate that helped bring a lot of the sphagnum back and uh, yeah 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 i just add, add on to that all i mean so um yeah kristen mentioned this uh i went to his workshop up in canada last summer in a yeah, they're, so they they sprinkle cuttings of sphagnum moss in areas where it's been um, sort of killed, um, like in peat moss mines um, or harvesting peat moss harvesting areas, and they were getting it to respread. Yeah, in years, um, but if it's not there at all, or you know, and in some of those ditches where you got really deep water, it it would it'd be hard for it to spread across a really deep part of the ditch. Um, we were seeing it though in some of those ditches up there. They had definitely spread back across much of the ditch. Uh, and then what, like, whatever that was, eight or nine years since the bog was restored. Um, so if it's got the right conditions, you can get it back. It, you know, it has to be really uh, moist. It has to stay moist all the time. Mm. Um, I mean, it could dry out a little, but it has to, you can't have the water table down like a few feet, you know? Yeah. These <laughs> drought years aren't helping. Um, we have uh, several more questions coming in. I'm going to read a clarification point or an additional point real fast before I get to those. Um, it's from... Uh, the DNR. So wetland banking projects that promote functional lift are relatively new, as Chris said, and but sometimes ditches are public waters and need to get a permit from DNR or if a public water or public ditch, it does need to go through the county drainage authority. I think that goes back to that question about working with other agencies. Okay, another question. So you ran through some negative repercussions of peatland restoration, like methane mercury release. Can you weigh these against the overall positives of peatland restoration? Uh, should these negatives ever be a reason not to pursue peatland restoration? Oh, yeah. Um, the, all right. Yeah, so, I mean, um, so the methane, we know, like, I mean, all well, natural, not all, but many natural wetlands release methane, right? So, I mean, I mean we kind of know that. Um, but you can, but the CO2, the wetlands releasing CO2 because they're drained, um, you can sort of stop that and slow them down. Um, and, you know, climate change has made all these things a little more likely to be a source of carbon, the CO2, for the CO2 pathway anyways. Um, and I don't know if I have a, I mean, a good answer. We know that, I mean, we know the peatlands have been sinks for, I mean, millennia, you know, and trying to reestablish that part and not have the peat break up, you know, decompose and emit CO2. The methane, it is a stronger greenhouse gas, but it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere. Um, it, it only lasts something like, I think, 10, 20 years, where CO2 is more like 150, 200 years. Um, so there's some trade-offs that way. But I mean, I think the general thought is, and I mean, Kristen will have additional thought on this, but is that, um, yeah, there might be some problems with the methane, but we can kind of manage that. And you're going to have methane release from natural wetlands anyways, but you can kind of restore some of the CO2 uh, balance. Well, they, yeah, some of the work from Canada is showing that the cut over peat or in the drain peat, the methane is actually less than than off of the intact peatland. And same thing with the mercury question. I think the reason they started looking at mercury was in the context of, you know, we're trying to build on an, an ongoing study. 
um, St. Louis River in Minnesota has a mercury TMDL, and they were initially observing that the mercury was higher coming off of these really drained peat watersheds than off the, the more intact areas. So I was hoping that it would, you know, that restoration could be a BMP down the road, um, or just trying to understand kind of mercury cycling better. And maybe it's one of those things where it's a uh, initial high release at once you get that chemistry re re restarted and then it kind of hits an equilibrium. Yeah, and I think we're we've also what reduced the uh, amounts of mercury that's being deposited in the atmosphere just from you know clean air rules. I think, and uh, so hopefully in the future that would be less too. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, one more I got. Uh, are these types of restorations being done in other areas of the world? Some of those other high peat areas? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, well, you can talk about Canada. Um, the other thing that, that, you know, they have a lot more peatland and they've, they've been doing a lot of peat uh, harvest. And the, well, I'll just say that our project is part of, of a prototyping project funded by Bezos Earth Fund through TNC. And there's at least eight other peatlands around the world. And there are peatlands in the tropics and peatlands in the high altitude mountains of South America, Peru and Ecuador. Um, so, and that book that I mentioned, Swamplands, is, is just kind of a real fun uh, travel log of all the different kinds of peatlands and what's going on in them around the world. And a very up to date. I think it's just published last year. Yeah, and there's been a lot in Canada and you know I'd say Northern Europe, like Scotland, Finland. Um, it's the and the UN. I mean, a lot of folks have gotten the UN uh, convention, the COP, the upcoming. It's been a bigger and bigger topic at all of the COP climate meetings as well as biodiversity meetings. Um, so. You know, hanging on to the peat that we have left and figuring out how to restore these degraded peatlands. Yeah. Um, I have another one. How supportive is the public and the government to peatland restoration? Do you see that support increasing in the future? What concerns do you have about the future of wetland peatland restoration? I think there's more. I mean, the state has 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 actually listed in under the climate action framework. So I think there's increasing recognition based on the science and, and the global kind of discussion about climate that um, that it's, you know, changing views about peatlands. Um, I definitely think, you know, we have a long history in Minnesota of thinking that all drainage is good. <laughs> and there's probably work to do at all of the, I mean, we know for sure that when EIP Ecosystem Investment Partners started the Lake Superior Wetland Mitigation Bank, that they did a lot of outreach to all of the neighbors and adjacent landowners, and and many folks were not um, not on board right away. And so, the fact that it is now, I mean, and, I, and yeah, there's always going to be people who, and one of the reasons why we want to understand these potential negative implications is we want to have answers to to the um, kind of roadblocks that people throw up. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think uh, people are interested in the climate change benefits more and more too. You know, people are always kind of looking for reasons to, I don't know, support or promote wetland restoration, and it kind of just adds an another one. And even in other parts of the state, it's come up. Um, we've seen it a few times uh, where people are just talking about restoring a wetland, and then they're not really thinking about that it's actually a peat a peatland. A lot of times, it's more like muck in the central and the south. You might have a couple feet of a muck. It's still a technically a peatland, you know, histosol. Um, anyway, so that's an interesting part of it too. I think there's there's a lot more of it than people realize in the south and central too. Mm. It's true. Usually we don't think about that muck as uh, the nice fibrous up north peat. Yeah. Um. Well, that seems to be all the questions that are in. Do y'all have any closing statements or thoughts that came up to you? Well, like I said, if there's anyone who had questions or corrections or wanna uh, and be in um, advisors on this, feel 
uh, I think Ted and, and um, Jack will be happy to share our contact info and, and we'll follow up. Um, and if we could um, potentially just make this available as a PDF, uh, or it's, I know it's a recording, but it's easier to just scan through the PDF. <laughs> Yeah, we can, if you send us up a PDF, we can put it on our website. It'd be easy. Great. Well, we really appreciate y'all coming in and presenting on such an interesting topic. It's a, a cool project and it's doing a lot of good things. So thanks. Good to hear about it. And hopefully this will spur some interest in that next year's Zach Simbog field trip. Yeah. It's a look one. Big bog, the big bog up north of Red Lake is pretty cool too. All right, all right. <laughs> New <laughs> ideas. Yeah, scientific and there's I don't know there's twelve or thirteen scientific and natural areas now that are peatland, the different kinds of peatlands with different hydrology. So, uh, yeah, the more you learn, the more there is to know. <laughs> yeah, that's the case. I'm gonna definitely be checking out some of those books. I had the um, the wetlands of Minnesota, or I forget which one it was, but uh, Chris had recommended me that book a while back uh, when I was in his class. So, oh really? Oh, I, had, I had read that one, so I'll be getting those new ones. So, anyways, I'll let everyone go. Thanks a lot for joining, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.